AM 1130 WCXI. Here's a special news bulletin from Teresa Tamio. Tragedy at Metropolitan Airport tonight. I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. A Northwest Airlines passenger plane crashed this evening at Metropolitan Airport. The Federal Aviation Administration says there were some survivors apparently among the 146 passengers and crew members on board that plane. Witnesses say the plane struck a freeway overpass shortly before 9 this evening near a car rental agency and may have been on fire before it crashed. WCXI's Greg Bowman is on his way to the scene, and we will have more details coming up this evening. Once again, a Northwest Airlines passenger plane. WCXI's Greg Bowman has been in the area for the past hour or so, and he's standing by live in Romulus. Greg, what can you tell us at this point? Well, Teresa, I'm about a mile from inside the airport grounds right now, and for anyone in the area, that's just about as close as you'll be able to get to the airport for some time to come. Uh, police have closed off almost all of the major access roads uh, to the airport following this terrible tragedy. Merriman Road, Middle Belt, I-94, also parts of I-275 going into the airport are closed. Uh, there are a number of gawkers here. Uh, traffic is obviously uh, jammed up. People who are here and heard about the plane crash if you are in the area, I would not uh, recommend uh, that you come out to, to look. Also, it'll just get in the way of police trying to, to do their job here as well. It's a it's a devastating scene. We're told that pieces of, of plane, pieces of the wreckage and bodies were scattered uh, for a large area throughout uh, the Romulus Metro Airport area. Again, a terrible tragedy here. I'm Greg Bowman, WCXI News, reporting live near Metro Airport. Witnesses say the plane was on fire even before it crashed. Douglas Rogers, who works at the Comfort Inn on Middle Belt Road near the airport, watched the horrifying scene. He says the plane was indeed on fire before it went down into a nearby car rental agency. And there was this one particular plane I saw take off, and it uh, was on fire. It shortly, shortly after taking off, it was on fire, and it turned over on its left side. And uh, I thought it was going to hit the hotel, and I ducked because I could feel the heat from the plane. And then I seen it hit the wing, left wing, hit the uh, the Avis building. There's a, a rental car place right across the street from uh, the Comfort Inn Hotel. Many roads surrounding the airport, of course, have been closed. The airport itself is very, very backed up. WCXI's Greg Bowman has been at Metro all evening talking to airlines officials as well as some understandably very nervous travelers. Greg is standing by live right now. Greg, what's the situation? Will anyone at all be able to leave the airport tonight? Well, Teresa, at least for Northwest Airlines passengers, it's going to be a very long night. Uh, they were told earlier that the flights uh, would be delayed. Now it looks like there will be no flights, at least on Northwest Airlines, uh, leaving until tomorrow morning. So they're going to have to be uh, put up in hotels at this point or perhaps uh, sleep here at the airport. As you mentioned, uh, the Northwest passengers I spoke to, they are visibly upset. They're shook up, as you might expect. Uh, they are concerned about what happened, but uh, many of them are philosophical, saying that uh, this is something that happens and it's probably uh, not anything that can be avoided. But one woman, Joy Hackle, told me, uh, she's flying to Washington. She says she's concerned about this flight. She's also concerned about the airline industry in general. And she says ever since the uh, airline controllers strike and the deregulation, the airline industry has been in big trouble. By the way, it is possible to get to the airport. Uh, you, don't, you can take Michigan Avenue and Merriman Road all the way in. It's a very slow process. Eventually, you'll get there. Uh, the major arteries, I-94, uh, I-275, other access routes to the airport are closed. You can get there, though, by taking Merriman Road. I'm Greg Bowman, WCXI News, reporting live at Metro Airport. The number of people killed in the crash of a Northwest jetliner last night has risen now to 153. Earlier reports indicated 146 people had perished in the crash, which occurred about 845 during takeoff. Northwest Airlines official Bob Gibbons says the plane was en route to Phoenix. There were 153 people aboard Northwest Flight 255. This included 143 adult passengers, two children, passen uh, two children traveling in passengers' laps, two off-duty Northwest employees seated in crew seats, and then the plane's crew complement, two pilots and four flight attendants. Five people on the ground were reportedly injured near the crash site. I cried. I cried. It was terrible to see. I couldn't believe it was happening to Metro Airport. 
While eyewitnesses try to recover from the horror they watched unfold last night, workers continue to comb through the wreckage of a Northwest passenger plane that crashed near Metro Airport, killing all 153 people on board. I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. It happened about 8.45 last night during takeoff of Northwest Flight 255 from Metro en route to Phoenix. Witnesses we spoke with, including Georgia Stevens of Lincoln Park, say it was an unbelievable sight. The plane was reportedly on fire when it hit a freeway overpass. We are getting ready to take the middle belt exit and we were within a few feet from going that direction and middle belt was completely burned. It was all on fire, the grass, the trees, uh, the cars, you could see cars, vehicles down there that were on fire. There was a billboard on fire, there was um, the Vidoc was on fire, uh, you could see parts of the plane. I don't know if it was bodies or what, but they were, there was parts and debris all over the place, just all over and everything was on fire and there was smoke and it was horrible. WCXI's Jeff Gilbert has been in the area all morning long, talking with officials, trying to find out just what happened. Now he is standing by live very near the wreckage site. Jeff? Teresa, I'm about 1,000 feet from the crash site itself. That's the closest any officials are letting any reporter get. Here at the corner of Lucas and Middle Belt Drive, you can't see any of the wreckage itself. What you can see, though, is where the stretch DC-9 clipped the top of the Avis River car building before it burst into flames on the highway here. A large chunk has actually been cut out of the top of that building while its wall is charred black. People who have been to the site of the wreckage say it's extremely difficult to even recognize it as an airplane. The fuselage has just burst into many tiny pieces. WCXI's Rafael Batanzos is in the main airport terminal where he's been talking to Northwest Airlines officials. Northwest officials are keeping mum about events surrounding the crash. A ticket counter manager told me to call their corporate headquarters in Minneapolis as I tried to question him. But off the record, I have found a couple of Northwest workers willing to talk. One person told me Northwest will probably use its freight terminal on Rogel Drive as a temporary morgue, but workers over there are objecting, saying they're not equipped to handle the task. As I mentioned officially, Northwest is not telling reporters anything, and they are now even keeping us out of the gate areas. Reporters are not even being allowed past the first security checkpoint. Raphael Batanzos, WCXI News at the Northwest Terminal. WCXI's Greg Bowman was at the airport talking with passengers just after the crash last night. Passengers at the Northwest Airlines Terminal here at Metro say they are concerned about the tragic plane crash. Still, most say it won't keep them from flying in the future because they still need to get where they're going. But Joy Hackle, who's flying northwest from Detroit to Washington, thinks the crash is just one more sign that the airline industry is in big trouble. And 22-year-old Monica Haney of Inkster, who witnessed the crash, says she was thinking about becoming a flight attendant before, but now she's not so sure. At Metro Airport, I'm Greg Bowman, WCXI News. It's 12 o'clock, AM Stereo, AM 1130, WCXI Detroit, a Shamrock Broadcasting Station. It's really not a time for a lot of words. There are just not a lot of words. Taylor Police Chaplain Emin Borish has spent most of the morning trying to console officers working at the scene of the nation's second worst air disaster. I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. There was only one air disaster in this country to claim more lives than last night's crash of Northwest Flight 255 near Detroit's Metro Airport. The 1979 crash of an American Airlines jet in Chicago, which killed 173 people. Today, 155 people are dead. Right now, we know that 153 of them were on board the Northwest plane en route to Phoenix. Two other people were killed, reportedly on the ground. It's a scene of devastation around Metro Airport. The plane went down around 8.45 last night. Witnesses say it was on fire before it even crashed. It also hit a car rental agency in a freeway overpass before slamming to the ground. WCXI's Jeff Gilbert has been near the wreckage most of the morning, watching federal and local officials go through what's left of the jetliner. The search for clues is a slow, tedious task, and members of the National Transportation Safety Board don't want anybody to disturb anything. Orange barricades and a single Wayne County Sheriff's deputy keep anybody not actually involved in the investigation about a thousand feet from the crash site. But from our vantage point at the intersection of Middle Belt Road and Lucas Drive, you can clearly see where the top of the Avis building was cut off. Several police vans discreetly blocked the wreckage and the bodies. You can, however, see movement on top of the I-94 overpass where the aircraft went down. Investigators trying to find some clue to explain the tragedy. Jeff Gilbert, WCXI News at Metro Airport. Was it the weather? 
Was it a mechanical problem, or was it something else that caused Northwest Flight 255 to crash in flames last night? We won't know for quite some time. Good afternoon. I'm Jeff Gilbert, WCXI News. That's the official word this afternoon from the National Transportation Safety Board, which only began its investigation this morning. It would not do any of us any good at this point to make any assumptions about what may or may not be involved in this accident, and whether it's related to those kinds of factors or other factors. We simply don't know, and we won't know until such time as we're able to, to, to collect the information that will allow us to make that determination. The National Transportation Safety Board member Dr. John Lauber says they're still recovering bodies, 154 of them trying to identify the victims and trying to determine just where that wreckage came from. All 152 people on that flight died. Two others were killed on the ground. WCXI's Rafael Batanzos has been on the scene all day. He tells us security is very tight. Police have barricaded Middle Belt at Smith Street. Only the few residents who live on Smith are being allowed through. Reporters and the curious are being kept at bay. We're about a quarter of a mile from the crash site. I can see investigators walking around in a few police cars with their flashers on. The task of removing the remains continues. The investigation is at its earliest stages still, and the work at the wreckage site could go on for days. At this point, the plan is to keep reporters away till morning. Rafael Batanzos, WCXI News, near the crash site. It's going to be at least a couple more days before Interstate 94 is reopened. It's been closed from Telegraph Road to I-275 because much of the jetliner's wreckage is strewn right across the highway. We had anticipating, anticipated that the uh, freeway would be open earlier this afternoon, but the Federal uh, Highway Administration as well as the FAA and several other authorities have uh, requested that we keep it closed until further notice. The State Highway Department's Brenda Redhead says the detours are now posted. At last word, Merriman Road was the only road actually leading into Metro Airport. The relatives of the victims are being carefully sequestered from the hundreds of reporters. Many of those relatives came to Detroit from Phoenix this morning and this afternoon. Newsman George Tanner tells us one of the planes carrying those relatives had some problems of its own. One plane with 22 relatives on board left about 7.30 exactly on time. The second one with 26 of the relatives on board didn't get off the ground immediately because of mechanical problems. Airport spokesman Rick Martinez says fortunately the problem was discovered on the ground. The plane uh, was taxied out and pilot brought it back in because of some hydraulic problems. The hydraulic system on a commercial aircraft is rather huge. It basically powers everything. Martinez says there were no complaints from the passengers who were obviously preoccupied with the loss of a loved one. George Tanner for WCXI in Phoenix. The Salvation Army has already opened up a counseling center for relatives of the victims. Lieutenant Colonel Clarence Harvey has been talking to those relatives, and he says more important, he's been listening to them. I've been an officer 27 years, and my last episode was in Kansas City when I was there for the Hyatt when it collapsed. And this has similarities to that. And our, our method of uh, communications is uh, trying to be as silent as possible and let people speak. It isn't as obvious, but the hundreds of policemen, firemen, and paramedics on the scene are undergoing a great deal of stress this afternoon as they search for bodies. Father Archie Rich, the Wayne County chaplain, says it's not the type of work you can really detach yourself from. They can't totally disassociate themselves. They're present, there's a task to be done, a job to be done, and they go out there and do it. Father Rich and other chaplains are on hand to help the rescue crews. All we have at this point are the barest facts, and we'll be pulling all of that together into, into a summary of the scenario as best we know it. Dr. John Lauber with the National Transportation Safety Board says it will take months and months of investigations before we learn what caused the nation's second worst air disaster. Good morning, I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. Northwest Flight 255 was en route to Phoenix when it crashed upon takeoff Sunday night near Metropolitan Airport. The exact death toll is still not known since the airline says 154 people died and a federal investigator puts the number at 152. There were also two deaths on the ground and a county medical examiner says the bodies were too badly burned to tell just how many victims there are. Although federal investigators say it's much too early to come up with any answers, John Lauber does say they have determined the situation with the air traffic controllers was normal, and they think the left engine of the plane was in worse shape than the right. Many eyewitnesses reported seeing flames on the plane's left side before it hit the ground, but Lauber says they have interviewed 25 witnesses, and there are some conflicting reports. Some eyewitnesses have reported seeing uh, an in-flight fire on the aircraft prior to uh, any impact with objects on the ground. 
and another group of eyewitnesses have reported no such indication or no indication of fire prior to the aircraft impacting with, ground, with the ground. The airlines and federal officials say it will be some time before they can release the passengers' names. The names of crew members were released yesterday by Northwest, as well as the names of three off-duty employees killed in the crash. But a number of passengers' names were compiled from various other sources. And so far, the partial list shows at least 10 Michigan residents were killed in that disaster, including one Detroit man, four others from the metropolitan area. <laughs> It is an unbelievable scene of twisted metal, charred pavement, and yellow flags. The flags represent where the victims fell. Good evening. I'm Jeff Gilbert, WCXI News. That's what Middle Belt Road looked like this morning as reporters were given the first opportunity to view the wreckage of Northwest Flight 255, a flight that claimed at least 157 lives. Rafael Batanzos and I were among those taken up to Interstate 94 to take a look down at the debris. The members of the various police agencies are slowly combing through what's left of the wreckage, putting personal belongings into oversized paper bags. Those belongings litter the east side of Middle Belt Road. There are suitcases, shoes, and everything just scattered all over the road. In fact, you can see where the plane impacted on the side of the hill, the east side of the hill, scorching the grass. A billboard is now only a charred reminder of what it once was. There are some small pieces of the wreckage scattered here. What looks like part of an instrument panel is clearly visible. The largest chunk of that wreckage is north of the freeway. That's where we find WCXI's Rafael Batanzos. In Investigators are picking through what appears to be the only solid recognizable pieces of the fuselage. It looks to be the front portion of the jet. Two wheels, part of the landing gear, are jutting skyward. It's so bent and twisted, it's easy to understand how so many people lost their lives Sunday night. Trailing behind the solid pieces are some insulation, a couple of pieces of luggage, blackened charred metal and other debris. Two men seem to be concentrating their efforts at the front of the solid pieces, pointing and probing, hoping to find some clues. Rafael Batanzos, WCXI News at the crash scene. Even though I-94 is now open, police are stationed on the middle belt exit ramp to stop onlookers. They say if there's a problem, they'll close the interstate again. The condition of Cecilia Chian, a four-year-old girl who survived the crash, has now been upgraded from critical to serious. She's still suffering from burns and a broken collarbone and leg. Her grandfather, Anthony Chian, says Cecilia's life was probably saved by her mother. Her mother, I know, shielded her. If you stop to realize the accident occurred seconds after takeoff, which meant the way we piece it together, from the short, in a short space of time from takeoff to the crash, she had to get out of her seat and put her body around little Seely to shield her from the fire. Paula Gian, Cecilia's mother, died in the crash, as did Cecilia's father, Michael, and her six-year-old brother, David. The latest death count, as I told you, was 157. General Motors was hit very hard by the disaster. Fourteen of its employees were on the flight, half of them from Michigan. Most were heading for the company's proving grounds in Mesa, Arizona. There were seven family members with them. From Phoenix, newsman George Tanner tells us the man in charge of those proving grounds was also on flight 255. There are 51 Arizonans listed as victims of Northwest Flight 255. One of them was 43-year-old Donald Briggs, who was manager of the General Motors Desert Proving Grounds in Mesa. He's remembered by public relations director Jim Mooney. He got out um, uh, among the employees, uh, knew almost all of them by their first name. Uh, probably one of the most caring uh, managers that I've ever worked for. Briggs took over the Mesa facility in May 1986. Also killed in the crash was Briggs' 42-year-old wife, Sharon, his 13-year-old son, Matthew, and 8-year-old daughter, Megan. George Tanner for WCXI News, Phoenix. Those who were on the scene Sunday night are only now coming to grips with what they saw. Wayne County Sheriff Sergeant Bruce Schneider says he went home about 6 Monday morning, but he couldn't sleep. I found myself staring at the ceiling after about two hours. Uh, I kept reliving and revisioning what we had walked through that night, and you couldn't get the smell out of your system. Uh, you know, barring, showering, shaving, changing your uniform, the, the, the stench that was here that night, uh, you couldn't get out of your system. While well, clergymen and professional psychologists are available to counsel the emergency workers, Schneider says the best outlet for most is just talk it out with a friend.
The only passenger who survived the crash of Northwest Flight 255 Sunday night has been taken off the critical list, and little four-year-old Cecilia Chian is expected to pull through. Good afternoon. I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. Doctors say the girl is now listed in serious condition at Mott Children's Hospital in Ann Arbor. She suffered burns, facial cuts, a broken leg, and a broken collarbone in that crash. She also lost her parents and six-year-old brother. Dr. Arthur Robin, chief of psychology at Children's Hospital in Detroit, says besides good medical care, she's also also going to need an awful lot of TLC, mostly because of the loss of her family. But he believes her age will help her bounce back. At that age, uh, people, children are very resilient. And so if physically she gets over the, the burns and other physical problems that she has, I think that she stands a good chance of uh, emotionally rebounding. I think it would be a, um, a slow, long process. First lawsuits have been filed in connection with the crash of a Northwest Airlines plane. Two men say they were injured when the aircraft hit the ground behind their truck. They are seeking unspecified damages from the airline and the manufacturer of that plane, McDonnell Douglas. Federal investigators at this point are not ruling anything out, but a lot of attention is being paid to one factor the weather may have played in that crash. There were wind shear warnings issued, and the plane was forced to use a different runway. Wayne County Sheriff Robert Vacano, meanwhile, says the investigation is a long, tedious process because there are so many things to look at. Well, things are going smooth uh, at this point, as, as well as to be expected, and uh, we're in the process of uh, finishing uh, uh, up uh, with our reports and, uh, and still interviewing some witnesses and uh, trying to just gather all the facts. The engines have now been moved from the crash site for inspection today. Officials at the site, meanwhile, found a rifle among the wreckage, but so far no explanation for that. 158 people died in the crash of Flight 255 Sunday night. The victims, as well as family and friends of the victims, will be remembered at a special noon prayer vigil in Detroit tomorrow. What we primarily uh, plan to do is just to pray for the families who have lost their loved one and those uh, the friends who have lost their loved ones. And that tragedy and we want to let them know that we are concerned and and we have they have their uh, we have their concern at heart the reverend joseph jordan is helping to organize that vigil which will be held at the pleasant grove baptist church on the quinder the red cross is also pitching in to help the family sabrina kellenberg says the workers have been in this from the very beginning the night of the crash we were out there to provide food and beverages for the emergency workers we also had crisis intervention counselors who were there to help console the families. We are working with Wayne County officials uh, and uh, mental health workers from the community to help console and comfort some of the family members as well as some of the uh, emergency workers themselves. Hilleberg says so far the families of the victims are trying their best to cope with the tragedy. Right now, it doesn't look like the crash is causing lots of cancellations for Northwest Airlines, and that doesn't surprise Doug Thomas, president of Fairlane Travel in Dearborn. Not necessarily. Our business tends to be business clientele and longtime clients that do quite a bit of flying. I think where you'll probably get the type of... Uh, of cancellations that you were referring to is first-time travelers or people that don't travel very much and are very, very attuned into any type of a tragedy and kind of put it in the wrong perspective. Thomas does say that many of his regular customers have complained about delays and lost luggage with Northwest, much of the problems, though, stemming from the airline's expansion at Metro Airport. There are very preliminary indications this morning that an almost unbelievable human error may have been involved in the crash of Northwest Flight 255. Good morning, I'm Jeff Gilbert, WCXI News. The flight data recorder indicates the plane's flaps were not in proper position for takeoff. That's something the crew would normally notice in their pre-flight checklist. John Lauber, who is heading the National Transportation Safety Board investigation, said the flaps weren't even mentioned during that checklist. The normal checklists do contain uh, uh, a an item regarding flaps and slats. Our review of the cockpit voice recorder at this point does not indicate uh, that there was anything mentioned about those uh, during the checklist that, uh, that, we, that were run. Lauber also said that an alarm that would have caught the flap problem didn't go off. He was quick to add that more study was needed to find out just where the flaps were and what factor the weather might have been. There's also more talk about the wind shear, the violent changes in wind direction that were noted just before the crash. At 8.22, there was a pilot report received uh, from uh, an, a, uh, an aircraft, uh, uh, a Northwest aircraft that was on approach to runway 21 uh, regarding a wind shear uh, that they encountered during that approach. 
Lauber said they still don't know what, if any, factor wind shear may have been in the crash of Flight 255. The probe into the crash, which killed 158 people near Metro Airport, has now focused on the configuration of the plane's flaps and slats, the panels on the front and back of the wings that move to provide proper lift for the aircraft. Experts say those flaps also help if the weather's a problem. The flaps are most important when there are other adverse conditions, and here the, the adverse conditions would have been a hot, humid day and the tailwind. Um, had they been on a longer runway, that might have helped. They would have lifted off at the same point, but the obstructions that they hit at the end of the runway would have, of course, been further away. The plane was moved to a different runway, and Dr. William Kaufman, an associate professor of aerospace engineering at the University of Michigan, says such situations with flaps have happened before, and it's something a pilot would not do intentionally. The controversy over the position of Northwest Flight 255's flaps has grown still greater. Good morning. I'm Jeff Gilbert, WCXI News. The initial word from the cockpit voice and flight data recorder showed the flaps were in the wrong position for takeoff. Now, three pilots who saw the plane on the runway say they didn't notice anything unusual. One co-pilot goes so far as to say the flaps were in the proper position. They were in a good vantage point to see the aircraft and see and uh, and uh, follow the rotation and takeoff and subsequent flight of the aircraft. National Transportation Safety Board member John Lauber says it would really help if they could get a hold of some of the photos it may have been taken of the plane before it lifted off. In general, though, that investigation's moving along. We're at the stage of the investigation where things are proceeding very, very smoothly. We've made uh, what I think, and I, th I know Mr. Drake agrees, uh, very satisfactory and, and I think rapid progress in this investigation. However, Lauber stresses that all information is preliminary and it will take a long time before they have a firm handle on just what caused Flight 255 to go down. Governor Blanchard's become quite irritated with all of the preliminary reports. He says all they really do is unfairly cast blame on the pilot. Why is it they always blame the people who aren't around to defend themselves? Especially when we know there have been serious safety and regulatory and maintenance problems, not just with Northwest, but all the airlines, and not just with the airlines, but with the federal regulatory agencies. Blanchard puts at least the indirect blame on deregulation, which he supported as a congressman, but now says he feels that airlines won't do enough to push for safety unless they're forced into it. The final list of victims should come out later today. However, those who lost a friend have already started the remembrances. Wayne State's McGregor Conference Center was heavy with the aroma of freshly cut flowers in memory of Detroit Attorney James Tuck. All eyes were on the oversized photo of Tuck that was placed in the meeting room. They called Tuck a supporter of civil and individual rights. A prayer vigil, though, at the Pleasant Grove Baptist Church was even more touching. A nurse was needed to help some family members through their ordeals. Others settled for the box of Kleenex that was passed around, as those who did and those who didn't know the victims openly wept at the message, Earth has no sorrow that heaven cannot heal. Most chilling of all was the premonition of a 12-year-old who didn't want to go on the plane, but was convinced by her father that air travel was safe. The father would put her on the flight to go back to her mother, because she had spent the summer here with her father. She begged her father not to put her on the plane because she said something is going to happen to this plane. Lenora Nelson's great-granddaughter Arlene died on flight 255. Her father heard the news on his way home from the airport and hasn't been able to cope with the grief since. O oh God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brothers and sisters from flight 255. One week after the nation's second worst air disaster, those who worked so hard to find survivors among the wreckage of a Northwest plane joined together yesterday to mourn and to pray. I'm Teresa Tamio, WCXI News. The memorial service at the Cathedral of St. Paul was dedicated to all those involved in the Flight 255 air disaster. The WCXI's Jeff Gilbert and Rafael Batanzos tell us it was mainly the workers who were first on the scene last Sunday who gathered at the Detroit church. As memorial services go, this was a Spartan affair, the ornate cathedral, making the tiny crowds seem all the smaller. The 80 or so people gathered were mostly Wayne County employees who came to make some sense of what happened and to pray for the victims. Let us at this moment observe a moment of silence in which each one of us may express our own prayer to those whom we mourn. 
the prayers were both private and public. We will not let your foot be moved. When he watches over you, will not fall asleep. This is Raphael Batanzos. Much of the service was spent honoring the police officers, firemen, and paramedics, as well as the others who came through so quickly at the time of the crash. An army, if you will, armed with the instruments of love and compassion, motivated by a desire to relieve pain and anguish. Wayne County Chaplain Archie Rich said they inspired him to work much harder during an event that nobody will forget. County Prosecutor John O'Hare said, The lesson we must all learn from last Sunday night is that life can be taken from us so quickly and that we must appreciate others while they are still here. Raphael Batanzos, WCXI News at the Cathedral Church of St. Paul.